Sure, they wanted to do something super cool, right? But they never really waited for the perfect idea. They arrived at a great idea by just starting to do something, which is so important because then you're testing it out, you're talking to people, you're understanding if that's something people even want, and then you're, you're, you're polishing your idea to what will eventually become a successful company. When we meet companies, and we probably meet like hundreds a month, probably between the four of us, um, behind the scenes after the meeting, one of the things that we see the most is we love the idea, but we're not sure it's the right team. Or we uh, sometimes think, I'm not sure they understand the problem at all. Or uh, uh, I just, you know, there's just no, like you said, found a market fit. And it's interesting because the people we meet are all almost always incredibly smart. But like you said, the maturity to know that, hey, we may not be the people to solve this problem, or to say, I'm gonna spend some time and understand what problems are interesting for us to solve. And I feel like these, are, these seem so simple when you know it, but um, these, are, these are not really steps a lot of founders take because there's this energy and excitement to start something. And, and I'm sure in, in your time here, you've met a lot of very young founders as well. What do you think differentiates the ones with the maturity to take a step back and say, hey, I'm not the right person to solve this problem? It's, uh, you have to start somewhere. So the, the, the story, like how did two 16-year-olds in Brazil got into payments, right? It's a pretty complex thing for you to become your passion when you're 16. And they both, both Enrique and Pedro, they have interesting stories. Enrique was a self-taught engineer, computer uh, engineer, because he wanted to play this game called Ragnarok. Any players of Ragnarok here? Uh, no, I think it's mostly a Brazilian thing. And he really wanted to play this game, and his mom wouldn't pay for it. So he had to learn how to code so he could play for free. And Pedro was an Apple aficionado since he was really young. And he, you know, his dad had these like Apple computers that was very, very rare in Brazil at the time. And he was just a huge fan. And he started jailbreaking the iPhone, right? Like especially a, a, a long time ago, the iPhone would have this thing where it didn't work in other countries, so you had to do some, some stuff with it. And he, he uh, jailbroke like the iPhone, did the jailbreak of the iPhone. Um, and when it, the new iPhone came, came up and it was kind of like uh, new and like extremely hard to do that, he was the first one in the world to jailbreak the iPhone 4. So that's, you know, he, he was 12 at the time. So he became sort of known for that. And one year later, he got Siri, like the Apple Siri, not, not, not Draper Siri, got the Apple Siri to speak the first language outside of English, which was Portuguese, because he hacked Siri to speak Portuguese. So he got some angry papers from, from Apple, uh, but made a name for himself. And they both were sort of like self-taught engineers, and eventually they found each other on Twitter. And they had this thing in common where, sure, they wanted to do something super cool, right? But they never really waited for the perfect idea. They arrived at a great idea by just starting to do something, which is so important because then you're testing it out, you're talking to people, you're understanding if that's something people even want, and then you're, you're, you're polishing your idea to what will eventually become a successful company. And Enrique, he participated on this hackathon uh, with an idea, it was a Tinder, so an online dating uh, app, but instead of geolocation, like Tinder does, it used uh, Facebook friends. So it would match you with your Facebook friends. And it, he had this idea to monetize the app, which was, in order to find out who the match is, you have to pay $1 or something. And when it, was, it came time to implement that, he realized that Online payment processors in Brazil were pretty bad. Like he couldn't really get one to work well. And then he realized that it was a much broader market, a much larger market, and a problem that he could solve. So that's how they first got into payments at the time. 
So uh, the founders who will, you know, pivoting and uh, meeting with a bunch of people and just starting with something, even if you don't feel it's the perfect idea, is a much better way to get to where you want to be than to just wait and design and think until you think it's perfect in your head. So perfectionism is, is sometimes like, you know, they say uh, done is better than perfect and perfect's the enemy of good. But what about intellectual honesty, right? Sometimes you just have to face it and say, hey, this is not working. Exactly. And I think very few people do that. Or you need someone who will say to you, you know what, I really respect you, but you're, you're kind of not really on track to success and that this product isn't working, we need to do something else. So uh, are the founders both very like, you know, just very realistic like that? Or is it just a dynamic that you guys built where you could say to each other, hey, this is not working, we need to regroup? No, 100%, if something's not working, we'd much rather um, like fail faster, right? And just mm -hmm. move on to the next to the next thing. So it has, we definitely have that ideology um, at Brex. And that comes with also measuring, right? Like uh, measuring what you're doing, it's really, really important because data speaks louder than intuition. So that's uh, an approach we take. So when it was just the three of you and you know, if one person was really wedded to one idea or one way of doing things, what frameworks did you use to test if something was working? Was it just data? Is it that all of you had a very data-first mindset? Or, or were, they like, were you staging an intervention and saying, hey, this is not working, we need to fix this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So the Brex public launch is known to be, which was July 19th, 2018. But our first customer, our first handful of customers, happened much earlier, happened in June 2017. Because there is this saying that we believe in a lot, which is if you are not embarrassed of the first version of your product, you launched too late. Exactly. And so, you know, when we first launched Brex, it was called Beyond because it was from the other company, Vision Beyond, right, the VR company. It was super simple. It was uh, like this blue, very cheap looking card. And, but it got us a long way because all of the theories we had or notions we thought we had of what founders seek and need uh, around financial services, a lot of them got confirmed, but a lot of them got disproved once we actually got real people to use the card. So we would always solve it by just letting the market decide. What's an example of, say, a feature you built and did you get feedback? How did you decide, okay, no, this is not working? So, a co like, one example is we were a little hesitant to launch with, without rewards, right? Because when you think about a, a credit card, you uh, rewards to a lot of people very important. And so to launch without that was something that we were consider, considering whether, whether it was going to be the right thing or not. Um, but we, at the same time, to build a robust rewards program, it would take a long time and a lot of thought for us to understand what matters to these founders and et cetera. So in our very first, we actually started off the card without rewards and we did the public launch without rewards uh, because we understood that no personal guarantees and no security deposits and instant sign up like we had. You didn't have to go to the branch. You could have just in 10 minutes sign up, have your card ready to go, was in itself a strong enough value prop that we would get the traction we needed to then build something more robust down the line, which is, you know, we then launched rewards six, around five, six months after the public launch, uh, in, uh, our, along with our Series C at the time. Got it. So that's one example. 